true and the living God. And for that, Lord, we just praise you, we honor you, we glorify you and magnify you for just being God. Now, Father, we come and ask you to forgive us for our sins, forgive us for messing up, forgiving us for falling short, forgive us, Lord, for not doing the things that are pleasing in your sight. We ask you to bless us now that we will hear from you through your word. Bless your word, Father God, to fall on this soil. Bless us, Father, that we will walk with you and understand your word. Give us evangelistic spirits that we, Father God, will know you in a very real way. And we will tell other people, other men, women, boys, and girls about the goodness of God. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen and thank God. <laughs> time at um, prepare. We want to close out tonight with the the chapter one and prepare. 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 <clears throat> there are five P's to effective evangelism. How many are there? Five. Five P's. What are they? Prepare. Prepare. Pinpoint. Pinpoint. Personalize. Personalize. Picturize. Picturize. And prescribe. And prescribe. These are the five P's to effective evangelism. Five P's <clears throat> to effective evangelism. Five P's. And these five P's are geared toward 
leading others to Christ and the main attraction, the center of attention is Jesus Christ. It is not about us. It's about Christ. It's not about the preacher. It's about Jesus Christ. It's not about our church. It is about Jesus the Christ. So Jesus Christ is the main attraction. Jesus Christ is the center of attention because Jesus Christ gave his life for us. Jesus Christ rose for us. Therefore, if men, women, boys, and girls are going to be saved, they will be saved through Jesus the Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Jesus died once for all. Jesus, Jesus alone died once for all. He will never have to die for the world ever again. He died one time, and that one time was for everybody. So it becomes up to us to receive him, and those of us who have received him, it becomes our responsibility to share Jesus Christ with the whole world. Amen? Amen. Prepare. I said to you last week that prepare is the most important part of soul winning. Prepare is the most important part of soul winning. What is? Prepare. prepare. You must be prepared. I also said to you last week, in every soul winning experience, it is broken down in two parts. There's a 90%, there's a 10%. 90% is preparation. 10% is actually sharing the gospel. 90% of your time in any soul winning experience must be spent in preparation. That preparation is prayer, Meditation and the study of God's word. In your soul winning experience, you must spend 90% of your time in preparation. It's praying, meditating, and studying, studying God's word. Said two things to you last week about when you're reading God's word, you must pray over God's word and you must pray God's word. What do I mean? What is the difference? Praying God's word and praying over God's word. Praying over God's word and praying God's word. What are the differences in the two? <clears throat> are there any difference? Am I just dreaming? Praying over God's word is praying over the book, praying God's word is praying his thing back to him, what he has already said to you. Amen. So we are praying God's word when we're repeating to God what God has said to us. How many of you have children? How many of you work with children? How many of you teach children? Mm -hmm. And if you teach children and you have children or you're around children, it just gives you great joy when they repeat what you say. You think they really got it when they repeat what you say. Such it is with God. God gets great joy when we repeat what he said and when we act upon what he said. Amen? So we must be prepared. We must read. We must study. We must meditate. We must pray. We want to repeat to God what God has said to us. We want to give God God's words. Another thing I talked to you about last week is that the situation is critical and the message is urgent. I didn't say it in those words, but I'm saying it tonight. The situation is critical. The message is urgent. When we look at the world in which we live, 
and we see how messed up it is, and we see people losing their lives for no real reason at all, we understand and we realize that we have a critical situation on our hands. It is more critical than you flying in an airplane and the pilot says, brace for impact. And the pilot does not practice emergencies with patients, with, with, with passengers on board. So if the pilot says, brace for impact, that means you're about to hit something. Yeah. It will be water or ground, brace for impact, or another plane these days. Evangelism is more critical than that. Because when men die, a physical death that is terrible but when men die a spiritual death it is a point of no return I talked about how critical it is and then the message becomes so urgent it is urgent that we get the message across it is urgent that we get the message out. It is urgent that we tell somebody about Jesus. Remember, we can't pull them to Christ, but we can share Christ. We can't force them to come to Christ, but we share Christ. Our responsibility is to sow seed, water the seed, and God gives the increase. The Apostle Paul says, some planet, some water, and then God gives the increase. In Jeremoaba, Brazil, it's a village way eight hours away from the city. It's called Jeremoaba. No, I can't spell it. But when we went to this village, the village had 300 people there. And these people had never read the Bible. So it was not good for us to go and take them a Bible. It wasn't even good for us. It wasn't good evangelism even to go and talk about Jesus. So what we did is took a 10-year plan and implemented that plan to share Christ with these people. And it was only to year five that we could talk about Jesus. And they would get it. We used storytelling from the Old Testament. We talked about nature from the Old Testament. And it took 10 different teams, five years before we could get to a point where we talked about Jesus on the cross. I think the last group that went, they were able to talk about a lamb and the people could visualize a real animal. The lamb dying for the sins of that nation. And then once we got them to understand that a lamb died, blood was shed, then we were able to transition after five years to transition to Jesus being the lamb of God who died on the cross for the sins of the world. So you got to be prepared that you can reach your audience. If you give these people a Bible, they use it for toilet tissue. And their restroom look nothing like ours. Matter of fact, their restroom doesn't look anything like our closets in the country. Our restrooms in the country. Our houses. Our outhouses are luxury to them. So you have to read the room. You have to read the atmosphere. One of my favorite uh, shows is Shark Tank, where people go on Shark Tank and they stand before these sharks and they present their, their contributions to the world, their inventions, and they ask the shark to invest in their project in order that their product would be successful and then they're going to give the shark a percentage. 
One of the worst pitches I've ever seen was about two weeks ago. A guy walk in, two brothers walk in, and they have this line of air fresheners. Their air fresheners were unique. And so every air freshener had something on it that people could identify with. It had a unique smell. It had a unique tone. And so Mark Cuban is there, and who is Mark Cuban? He is the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, right? Listen to this closely. I'm telling you, you got to read the room. You got to read the atmosphere. You got to know who you're talking to. And when it comes to sharing Christ, you must know what you're dealing with. Mark Cuban is sitting there. He owns the professional basketball team known as the Dallas Mavericks. They come in. These two brothers have a air freshener with a professional basketball team on it. Now, if I'm going before Mark Cuban in the Shark Tank and I want Mark Cuban to invest in my product, Brother Miles, what team am I going to have on this air freshener? I'm going to have the Dallas Mavericks on. And before it got to that point, I told Sister David, I said, oh, it's going to tee him right off. Mark Cuban is going to blow a gasket. And he did. He stood there. These two guys stood there. Mark Cuban sitting on the far left like he always. And these guys, one of them looked directly at Mark Cuban, put the air freshener up to his nose, and said, Mark, this one smells like winning. And it was the Golden State Warriors. He looks at Mark Cuban and says, Mark, Mm, this one smells like winning. Mark Cuban says, you have to learn to read the room. I'm out. What was wrong with Mark? I mean, why did he get such an attitude? <laughs> Mark Cuban I would have given you $150,000. But this is the only team that consistently keep knocking us out of the playoff. And you walk in here with the Golden State Warriors. You say, I'm out. So the rest of the Sharks start messing with Mark. And they said, Mark, what, why such an attitude? He said, because this is the only team that locked, knocked us out of the playoff last year. You got to learn to read the room. And Mark had an attitude and the whole world saw it. When we share Christ, we must, and this is later on in, in personal lives, but we need to make sure we learn to be in the now with who we talking to. We must learn to get on their level. We must learn that the situation is critical, your message is urgent, so you must be able to present it the right way. Gotta be able to present it. Today I got a chance to post something about Fox News. I've never in my life even thought about posting anything about Fox News. But it was such a great story. About two weeks ago, a preacher was up preaching. About, about four or five guys walked in the back and they sit down. And then, you know, people are still going through pro, uh, COVID protocol. So they sit in the back and they just sit there. But the pastor is a retired police officer. He's preaching. He watched these guys come in and he keeps preaching. But he noticed that they got guns on. So he preaches and he, he gets the attention of the other brothers and he says, lock every door. I would think he wanted to open the door. But he says, lock every door. And he preaches and he walks right down there where they are and he asks them, why are you all here? And he says, they say, well, we came to church. 
Oh, so you were just walking down the street or driving down the street and you saw a church and decided to stop here and have church? Sounds like a preacher was pretty mean, huh? He said, well, who sent you here? And they said, well, we just came to church. And as he approached them, he said, well, can I pray for you? By then, you got about 12 men surrounding these guys. Mm. Can we pray for you? Yeah, we can pray for you. And by the time he said, yeah, we can pray for you, one of the guys' gun hit the floor. Mm. He tried to push it on the seat. Mm. So by now, the pastor is sharp enough to get 911 on the phone, somebody, he tells somebody to call 911. They locked all the doors. They concealed these guys in. And they began, the men surround, they began to pray for them. And then uh, it, it became a reality that they were there to rob the church. You must know your surroundings. You must know your audience. Now, he could have started calling them out in the name of Jesus. But was it time for that, Sister Woods? He could have just started a war and everybody got shot. Wrong place, wrong time, wrong attitude. But he was sharp enough and he was experienced enough to know why they were there. He didn't upset them. He asked to pray for them. And it was a great testimony. It could have gone any other way. So he, the, the caption says, Holy Ghost Turf. They came on, on Holy Ghost Turf. And the Holy Ghost arrested them. And then the police arrested them. My brother-in-law used to work for a youth department in the, in the youth department. When they found out he was a preacher, they would always come in and say, Hey, Reverend, I, I found Jesus. I, I got saved the other day. He said, Yeah, you're right. That's a good thing. I'm proud of you. He said to them, "You That means you won't go to hell, but you're going to jail. <laughs> Hallelujah. You won't go to hell, but you're getting ready to go to jail. You must know your audience. You, met, you must not get so emotionally involved until you just lose all thought pattern. But the situation is critical. One of the examples I used last week is when it's, when it's your child, you get in a hurry. When it's your child, you know it's an emergency. When it's your child, you ought to treat other people as if they're your child. Because if it's your child, you carry yourself in a different way. What do you do? When your child is in trouble, you drive on the left side of the road, you blow your horn, you holler at people, tell them to get out of my way. I got to get to this emergency room because my child is in a, a bad situation. I got to get them to the doctor. So come on, Sister Davis, and, and demonstrate with us today how important it is for us to win souls for Christ. Y'all didn't know we had a baby, did you? We got a baby. We got a baby. And so, Sister Davis, tell us about our baby. And Pastor Davis is going to help me. Introduce our baby. baby. <laughs> this is Melissa. And Melissa is beautiful. Look at those big, beautiful eyes. You see those eyes? Look just like her daddy. She's really beautiful, but her daddy did not uh, comb her hair today before he brought her out. And so, um, but she's a pretty girl. And, but, and she does, she looks really, really good, but guess what? Melissa has a heart condition. And it's critical. And so we have to get Melissa to the doctor. And the doctor is Jesus. And Jesus is the only one who can save Melissa. So that's why it's so urgent that we have to get Melissa to the doctor. Because we know that looks cannot save us. And we know that uh, Jesus Christ is the only one who can save our souls. So we have to get our child, Melissa, to the doctor. Thank you. Man, you good. <laughs> so, no, you stand right here. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is our baby, Sister Brown. Uh, I like so, this baby. 
This baby has been to Brazil, been to Czech Republic, been to Mississippi, been to Texas, right. Louisiana, and everywhere we take this baby, somebody want to adopt our baby. <laughs> but Melissa is beautiful, so they love Melissa. Right. Yeah. But And she got beautiful eyes, she got beautiful brown skin, she got nice kinky hair. Melissa is a beautiful baby. She's a doll. She is. She has a good attitude. She doesn't give us any problem. No. Melissa doesn't talk back. No. She doesn't even have scars on her skin. Melissa no. looks perfect. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but Melissa has a problem. Right. Right. She has a heart problem. My, my, my. And it's a heart problem that's a deadly issue. And if she doesn't get to the doctor, she's going to die. Right. But because it's our child, we're going to make sure Melissa gets to the doctor. Yeah. And now if you see someone or you experience someone or you know someone who's not born again, you need to approach that person as if that person is your child. Right. And the situation being so urgent so critical that your message must become urgent. That's People are dying and going to hell every single day and we walk past them. We don't say anything about Jesus. We just let them die and go to hell. But as of tonight, from this night only, from this night forward, brother, I want you to make sure you see your child in every unsaved person. And regardless of how people are beautiful, regardless of how kinky and lovely their hair is, regardless how how well dressed they are, they need Jesus. Thank you so much. Situation is critical. This situation is critical. Therefore, the message must become urgent. It must become urgent because no one want anyone to die and go to hell on your watch. No one want anyone to die and go to hell on their watch. So I want you to join with me in reaching souls for Jesus Christ. And the only way you can be effective at it is that every person you come across, you view them as your personal child with a heart condition. And they need to see the doctor. Who's the doctor? His name is Jesus. He is the heart fixer. The old folks used to say, he's a heart fixer and a mind regulator. His name is Jesus. He's the great healer. Jesus has to always be the main attraction. In the midst of preparation, the soul winner must have a soul winner's cool toolkit. There ought to be something in your kit that you use to get the patient to the doctor. Who's the patient? Anyone who's not saved. And we got to get them to the doctor. And we must spend this preparation time in the Word. We must spend this preparation time. 90% of our soul winning time, we must spend it in Bible study, in prayer, in meditation. Whereas we spend only 10% of that time actually sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and reaching souls for Christ. Okay, who has uh, 2 Chronicles 16 and 9? <clears throat> 2 Chronicles 16 and 9. 2 Chronicles 16 and 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, ye shall have, you shall have wars. Amen. So God's eyes are looking to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for somebody he can show himself mighty through. And if you choose not to, to, to allow him to turn your heart toward him, show himself mighty through you, you have done something foolish. You have done foolishly if you don't allow God to turn your heart toward him. 
when we talk about soul winning, it takes our heart to be turned toward God. You have to be serious about soul winning. And you can't be serious about soul winning unless your heart is turned toward God. Who has Acts 1 and 8? <clears throat> Acts 1 and 8. Acts 1 and 8, it says, But ye shall receive power, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You will receive power. This power comes from the Holy Spirit. This power is dudamas. It is the same power we get from the word dynamite. It is explosive power. If you look back at verse number 7, Acts chapter 1, verse 7, it's a different kind of power. This is exclusive power. It is the authority, it is the ability, it is, it is the authority. Check this out. When the police shows up, it doesn't matter if she's four feet tall or he's five feet in one. When he shows up, he has both dunamis power, the power to get work done, and she has the authority, exclusive power. You can identify the power in which power is being executed by looking at the uniform. The uniform says, I have the authority. The badge says, I have the authority. The conversation says, I have the authority. The flashing blue, white, and red lights say, I have the authority. But then there's a gun, there's a taser, there's a blackjack that says, I got explosive power. I got dynamite power. Because the, the authority has given me the power to use it. When you look at Romans chapter 13 and Hebrews chapter 13, you will find out that there is no authority given for those who are righteous. In other words, the police officer wasn't made for the righteous man. It was made for the unrighteous. Now, having said that, I know you're already saying they don't use their power properly. But I believe that at least 75% of them are righteous in how they distribute their power. We have to understand that God has given us power and we can move according to God's unction and we can move according to God's movement and we can evangelize for him. Who has 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 5? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 5. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. Amen. So we look when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 5, it gives us the ingredients of the gospel. First of all, the gospel is good news. I made the analogy last week. It is it's gospel. It is go spell. Go and tell somebody about Jesus. And when you look at the gospel, it is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it comes with evidence in the fact that he was seen after he rose from the dead. When we look at John chapter 6, verses 44a, verse 44a, no man comes to the Father except, no man come to me, Jesus is talking, no man comes to me except the Father which has sent him draws him. 
So in other words, we can do the work and we ought to do the work because God has assigned the work to our hands. But God does the drawing. God tugs at the heart. God does the drawing. And when God does the drawing, God knows how to situate someone at the right place at the right time so you can give them the right message. Those boys that walked in that church the other day, God actually sent them there to save their lives. Because if, if they had not stopped by the church, they were going to go and mess up their lives and possibly get killed somewhere else. God arranges opportunities. God put things in the presence of people. God put us in people present so we can win them to Christ. We are soul winners. We are about winning souls. We don't just sing just to have a good singing, a sing a thong. We don't just sing so we can say, oh, I did that today. We don't usher, we don't greet. We're not first impressions ministry just because we want to smile. We don't preach just because we like preaching. All that we do, we don't do the media ministry just so we can do some in church. All that we do, we do it to win souls to Jesus Christ. We want to make sure we've done our part so God can just draw them. God set the appointments. And when you get there, you realize you're not the doctor. You're just there to introduce the doctor. The, the administration of the hospital, the, the clerk at the front desk, the appointment center, none of them have gone to medical school usually. But you are there so they can pass the baton over to the doctor to pass you along the way to the doctor. That's what we are. We, we are interns that God, use, God uses to get others to the doctor. And the good thing about it is, we know the doctor, and we want everybody else to know him. If you have a heart problem, you don't go to a back doctor. You go to a cardiologist. And then when the cardiologist uh, sees you, he or she does not perform surgery, they send you to a heart surgeon. Everybody got their own gift. Everybody got their own way. Everybody got their own presentation. <clears throat> this passage in John chapter 6, verse 44, the scripture places a responsibility on the soul winner to simply present the gospel truth. It is strictly so you can present the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, Jesus' death, Jesus' burial, Jesus' resurrection, and the fact that Jesus was seen, the seen or appeared part is evidence that he said he's gonna do it and he should have did it, he got up early. We must always Present the gospel truth. We must not focus on our personal conversion experience. In personal lives, we're going to focus on our personal conversion experience. We're going to talk about that. But your homework assignment was what? <laughs> so David said, what homework? <clears throat> I ain't been doing this for 23 years. What homework? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Homework assignment was for you to present in writing your salvation story of when Jesus saved your soul. Your personal testimony is a great testimony, but the bottom line is it is his story that you got to tell people. So your homework assignment is to present your personal 
salvation experience. Sister Davis said she did it 23, maybe almost 24 years ago, right? You want to tell, come on up here and tell that story. Come on, run, hurry, get in a hurry. Come on, tell us this story. Come on, tell us this story of, of how you had to, how you had to present this story. Why you had to present this story. Okay, I can tell that. <laughs> Why did I have to present the story? Because when we met, he wanted to make sure that I was saved. And so he wanted me to write my salvation story. And that's what I did. And I had to include the scripture on how God saved me. And all I had to do was admit that I was a sinner, believe that Jesus was God's son, and confess my sins, and then ask Jesus to come into my heart to save my soul and to make me a new person. And so I did that. And that's what I wrote 23 years ago, 20 something years ago. Okay. She doesn't know when she got married. <laughs> Don't ask her that. She'd be lost. So could you imagine me marrying somebody unsaved? Somebody I wasn't sure about saved? Here I am, I'm just floating around the place, going places, talking about salvation, and I got this woman with me that don't know Jesus. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what that is like? That, that's a train wreck at 55 miles an hour. 55 going this way, 55, that's a 10 miles an hour train wreck. So my thing is, uh, if you don't mind, I would like for you to write your salvation story. Because I can't go down that road. What if every person you dated would have to write their salvation story and tell the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and support it with scripture? What you gonna do when a guy walks up to you and say, I, can, I like you, but I need to make sure if you don't mind, this time tomorrow, have your salvation story ready. Boy, I'm putting some stuff on some people's minds tonight. And then you turn around and ask him, do you have yours? And he needs to present his salvation story. Right. Two same people, equally yoked, at least in the same spirit. You got to at least know Jesus. Can you imagine living, living 25 50, 60 years with a person and one of them don't know Jesus. Woo! So your salvation story is very important. Our responsibility is to present the gospel's truth. The focus is not on our personal experience. It's not on catchy phrases. And it's not on current events. With the internet, we got current events everywhere now. We used to have to wait on Jet and Ebony and, uh, and other little magazines to get our current events and news on TV. But now current events are all around us and people get tempted to preach current events, get tempted to teach current events. And if you use these as catches, that's fine. If you use those as attention getters or hooks, that's fine. But your focus ought to be on Jesus. Jesus has to be the center of attention. And it can't be on the latest gossip. It has to be on Jesus. If you're going to win souls God's way, you have to talk about Jesus. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only thing that will turn hearts toward God. That's it. Nothing else. It is the only thing that will turn hearts toward God. A soul winner must always be prepared to be a witness. A soul winner must always be prepared. I'm talking about the soul winner's toolkit now. The soul winner must be prepared to share Jesus Christ and be a witness for him. Now I want to give you some tips on what you ought to have in your tool pouch. 
your tool kit, your tool bag. Number one, a journal. We're not keeping a journal just because the pastor said we ought to keep a journal. We're keeping a journal so we can refer to it. A journal. Keep a journal in a record during your devotional periods. Keep a journal. Keep records during your devotional period. Before I started preaching, every church I went to back in the, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, they, if every church you walk into, they had a, a big old banner across the top. Right, Brother Miles? And, and at the Homer Street Church, it was the year banner of what we're going to talk about for the year, what's going to be preached about for the year, or the church slogan for the year. And even today, we see driving around in the, in the neighborhoods and in the, on the freeways, this big old white sticker with red right on the slogan. So every year at most churches in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, they have a big old banner across the top. And that banner would give you a theme for the year in about three scriptures. So when it came to me, as I went from one church to the other, I wasn't preaching, wasn't thinking about preaching, didn't want to preach, didn't want to have anything to do with no preaching. But I would go in and I would look at that banner and, and then I would compare the scripture with the, with the theme. And I dare tell you, 98% of the time, the theme in the scripture didn't match at all. But I was keeping a journal. I looked back in 1985 at the journal that I kept. It's still around. I still have it. And I was praying in 1985, Lord, give me a Christian supervisor that will understand my Christianity. Lord, bless me to make $20,000 a year. Oh, y'all laughing at me. This is 1985. I was making $14,000. Lord, bless me to make $20,000 a year. Lord, and I was, I was journaling my prayers. I was journaling, journaling my Bible studies. And I was journaling the Bible study of other people. So I got this collection of books. So one thing that the soul winner must keep is a, in his toolkit is a journal that you would journal and keep your devotional periods in it, keep things that you run across in it. Write down your thoughts and ideas as the Holy Spirit bring things to your remembrance. Sometimes I'm preaching and teaching, I see people write notes. You ought to have a journal that you can go back and look over. The example that I like to use is in the country we had this cow. He had an inner stomach and an outer belly. And he would chew on this same cook 24 hours a day. Y'all know what cook is? Okay, he put grass in his mouth and it would, it, would, it would turn to a hard substance. And he would chew it. Same thing all day long. And he would drop it down in his inner stomach. Then he would bring it back up and he would chew the rest of it and he would drop it down in his outer belly. And what he was doing is he was getting everything out of it he can get out of it. So therefore, when I look at the word of God, we got to get everything out of it we can get out of it. In other words, we are chewing on it, dropping it in our spirit, bringing it back up, and it comes up at the right time. The moment you're about to cuss, you hear, you hear the Lord saying to you, a, a soft answer will drive away wrath. The moment they get on your nerve, you hear the, you hear the scripture says in, in Proverbs 25 and 29 that a, a person who has no control over his own spirit is like a city whose walls broken down because you meditated on it. You've written it down. And you're prepared. Number two, Bible study. Study and meditate on the word daily. Bible study. You ought to have your personal Bible study. Study and meditate on the word daily. Number three, pray daily in the, and beseech the anointing presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Prayer. Pray daily. 
and ask God to bless you to stay in the words. Don't just ask him for stuff. Ask him to keep your mind focused on the word. Prayer. Pray daily. Beseech the anointing presence and power of the Holy Spirit. The circumstances and challenges of life will cause us to participate in consistent prayer every day. Your circumstances your situations, the stuff that you're going through, your challenges, they will bring you to your knees, baby. Uh -huh. you sure right? And the best way to fight a battle is on your knees. On your knees. Right. Prayer. Prayer ought to be in the soul winner's toolbox. Prayer. The next one is consecration. Decide on a regular time to pray. I know, I know you're holy. I know you're going to pray all day. I know you're going to have prayer all the time. But you ought to have a certain time that you get along with the Lord and talk to God. If you're married or you're close to somebody or you got a friend, you ought to have a prayer partner that can be a prayer warrior for you. That you can, you can just lay it all out there. Concentrate on God through prayer and, and decide a regular time to pray. Designate a specific place that you can pray. Be faithful. Be consistent. Designate a specific place, a specific time. Now, let me tell you, when the Rockets won the championship, they waited more than an hour for Hakeem Olajuwon. Because they, the, they had the parade in the middle of his prayer time. Mm -hmm. And guess what? He didn't rush. Nope, sure and, they and they waited. Mm -hmm. See, Muslims are bold. Christians are timid. Mm -hmm. The whole world is looking at the world champions. Waiting on a parade to start. And Akeem Elijah one did not get in a hurry. He didn't cut it short. They waited well over an hour. Some of you may know how long he waited. They waited. But they waited on him. And then when you're in consecration like that, they can start the parade without you. <laughs> because you're talking to your God. So prayer is utmost important. Consecration is utmost important. Then the next one is devotion. Write down things for your memory banks. How many of you like me today, you can't remember everything you did for the last 24 hours? Anybody in the house? We don't have any teenagers in here, so is there anybody else in the house like me? I said 24 hours. Some of us can't remember 12 hours. It is no reflection, no bad reflection on us. It's just a way of life. Daddy used to say, it sure is a blessing to get old, but it sure is inconvenient. <laughs> so we must have devotion. Our devotion time ought to be a time when we spend time with God we write down things to put in our memory bank. Our devotion time ought to be studying the word of God. Our devotion time ought to be praying over the word of God. Our devotion time ought to be praying the word of God. We must be prepared to take advantage of any soul winning experience. And God is so faithful, he keeps revealing it to us. He keeps showing it to us. Keep giving us opportunity. And keep giving us the opportunity to share Christ. So God sets the stage for the, he sets the environment, he sets the relationship, and he sets the circumstances. God does it. A cardiovascular surgeon or a cardiovascular person or a team study many years, several years, to become experts in their field. 
But here we are, we supposed to be soul winners, and we won't spend two hours to perfect our craft. We ought to spend time. And guess what? The, the, the young man across the street, Kenneth across the street from where I live, he, he's, he's a, he's a uh, cardiologist now. During his time through high school, through college, through med school, he didn't even come outside half the time. You didn't see him up and down the road throwing football and playing basketball. You wouldn't even know he was in the house if he didn't roll the, the trash can to the side of the street. I asked him several times, you dating? I don't have time for that. Because he studied 12 years, 16 years. And then now that he's a cardiovascular um, specialist, now he's still studying. And if we're going to be experts in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, we got to study Jesus and study his word. We must be spiritually prepared to witness to sick patients. We must be spiritually prepared to witness to people. We must impact people in a way that it lasts for eternity. We talk about leaving a legacy. Everybody wants to leave a legacy. A basketball legacy, a football legacy, a baseball legacy. At my, at my class reunion, we couldn't even remember which one of the guys played on which semi-pro team. We, we couldn't even remember whether they played for the Dodgers or the Astros, the Indianola Astros. We couldn't remember who played for the club, the Indianola club, Cubs. Because after that age is gone and after that ability is gone, it's not important anymore. But what is always important and always will be important is the soul winning that you do for the kingdom of the world. The sharing of the gospel. Winning souls is a very, very, very serious matter. And it should be approached by the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's a serious matter. You have to be prepared. You have to be, remember that it's your child. It's not just another dead drug dealer, just not another dead thief. It's not just another dead burglar. It is your child. And when you look at it and you accept the fact that it's your child, your heart goes out. And you want to win souls for Jesus Christ. Tell your story. I was coming home after, after, a, after a 12 hour shift, then a two hour meeting from the chemical plant, I was coming down 225, and you know, you know how it is, you know, it's in the middle of the summertime, it's like June 20th, or, uh, June, June 10th or something like that, and you know, it's been 16 hours since I've been home, and you know, I gotta get home, so I'm, I'm weaving in and out of traffic, you know, like I do, like I did when I was young. I'm weaving in and out of traffic, and all of a sudden I look to the left on the other side of the freeway. There's a woman standing outside her car. She was leaning in the car, and I saw her standing on the back seat, a baby standing on the back seat. It's, it had to be 130 degrees in that car. So I took the exit because, you know, if it's a woman and it's a child, I got to go to the rescue. But, you know, I'm still one to win souls for Christ. I take the exit, I make a U-turn, turn around, and when I get out of my car and walk up to a car, there's a man with his head under the, head, under the hood. I said, dog, I could keep going. There's a man here already. But since I had stopped, I had to aid, uh, render aid, and we couldn't get the car to start, and then we took the Baytown Tunnel. And when we went into the tunnel, we, I, I got them there, then, I, then we had, I had to bring them back, and when I got back, on my way back, the man was unsaved. The woman was saved when we went in the tongue on the way back. The man was unsaved, but he couldn't speak English, but the woman could speak English and Spanish. You talking about speaking in tongues. This is speaking in tongues. So out of respect to the man, I said, hey, 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 make sure you tell him everything I tell you. And so I would say, uh, I need him to get to know Jesus. She would say it in Spanish. 
I would say, uh, are you interested in getting to know Jesus? She would say it in Spanish. I would ask the question, uh, are you willing to get to know Jesus right now? Now I'm not weaving in our traffic. I'm taking it easy. Because we're about to go in the tunnel, and I want something to happen while we're in the tunnel. So I, I said, well, would you receive him right now? And that man bowed his head in that car. And when we went in the tunnel, he was praying and inviting Jesus Christ into his life. When we came out of the tunnel, the same man that went in, an unsaved man, came out the tunnel, a saved man, because I was prepared. I was looking for an opportunity. I was asking God to bless. And that same man received Jesus Christ. A bilingual communication. Now that's speaking in tongues. The door of the church is open. There may be somebody who's never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. This is your moment. This is your opportunity to get to know him. If you can believe in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, that Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried in a borrowed tomb, and he rose from the dead. You can be saved today. You can be born again today. You can be saved right now. If you would, just bow your head with me and invite Jesus into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe now that you are born again. You are saved. You are on your way to heaven. And when you leave this earth, you will open your eyes in heaven. And if you need a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the main attraction and the center of attention. You ought to try Jesus. And you need a church home. Inbox us. Write us a letter. Let us know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church. We'll be glad to have you. We'll be glad to celebrate with you if you receive Jesus Christ on tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Please join us every Wednesday night at 7.15 at the New Beginning Church. Come on out and be with us and spend some time in the Word. Please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Bible study for Sunday school. And then join us at 10.30 a.m. for our regular scheduled service. Again, thank you for being a part of our service. It is now offering time. If you want to give electronically, you can give by, by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your offering, you can do so by mailing it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We ask you to bless every giver in Jesus' name. For those of you who are here, you can, you can come on up and give now. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being part of our service. Please tune in with us on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for calling us to be witnesses. Bless us, Father God, that we will witness unto you. We will witness for you. 
and that men, women, boys, and girls will hear the gospel story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join by singing. Amen. Amen. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Thank you.